So without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Terry Getzek, who's professor of medicine in our division, director of the Familial Mediterranean Fever Clinic and Program, one of the legitimate world's experts in, this, in that disease. And uh, she's going to moderate the session this morning. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Welcome, everybody. Um, our first speaker is Lynn Shapiro Connolly, who will be speaking to us about the evaluation and management of chronic diarrhea. Just a little bit about Lynn. She came to us to UCLA via Stanford University for her GI fellowship. And while a fellow at UCLA, she received her master's degree in clinical research from the biomathematics department. She works with Dr. Emron Mayer, who's the director of the Gale and Gerald Oppenheimer Center of Neurobiology of Stress, on research looking at brain signals involved in obesity and food addiction. Lynn is a general gastroenterologist working at Santa Monica UCLA, who has a lot of clinical expertise um, and really is an expert in functional GI disorders and inflammatory bowel disease. Lynn? Thank you. And thank you for the course directors. Apparently, everyone thought that morning coffee would be a good time to discuss diarrhea. So this is obviously a very broad topic. So I'm going to try to spend the next 20 minutes focusing on what I hope is um, a few high yield topics, starting with the diagnosis. In the past, diarrhea has often been defined by a certain weight or by a certain frequency. The challenge with that diagnosis is if you have a patient, for example, a vegetarian who has a very high fiber diet, their stool weight may be greater than 200 grams. And likewise, if your patient only has one bowel movement a day, but it is all water every day, they're still going to be complaining of chronic diarrhea. So most people agree that the definition should be based off of stool consistency. And you're also, of course, going to rule out any defecatory disorder or fecal incontinence that your patients may be confusing with diarrhea. The list of chronic diarrhea differential diagnosis is very broad. And I bring this up because even though it's 2016, history and physical exam for chronic diarrhea is essential. By the time you start your evaluation, you should already have a few good ideas as to what you think is going on. That said, a lot of your patients are going to have a functional cause of chronic diarrhea, IBS, functional diarrhea being the most common. Medication is also very common. The common culprits include metformin and SSRIs, but of course you also want to consider osmotic factors such as is your patient having sugar-free gum or sugar-free candy? Also supplements that your patient may not even consider a supplement such as drinking aloe vera juice every day. When you read reviews of chronic diarrhea, the algorithm for how to go through the evaluation is very extensive and usually doesn't even fit on one slide. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be more broad and again, keeping in mind that your history and physical exam should really be directing a lot of this. So for most of us, when we see a patient in the office, once we've ruled out diet or medication or defecatory disorder, we're really asking ourselves, does my patient have IBS or do they not have IBS? If we feel confident that our patient has IBS and there's no red flags, then there's really not a lot of additional workup that you would really need to do with the exception of possibly ruling out celiac disease. But if your patient does not have IBS or there are red flags, then you're going to be moving into laboratory exams. Most patients get some baseline lab tests. And then depending on if your patient has bloody diarrhea, watery diarrhea, or steatorrhea, you're going to be getting some additional tests, a pathogen screen, TSH, maybe an HIV test, celiac panel, or looking for fecal fat. If nothing has given you the diagnosis at this point, then we're going to move into endoscopy or imaging. 
So with bloody diarrhea, most patients are going to end up getting a colonoscopy, with some people arguing that in a subset you could do a flexible sigmoidoscopy. With watery diarrhea, again, you also may be considering endoscopy, for example, for microscopic colitis. Or if your history is suggestive of neoplasia, then you may want to do abdominal imaging. For steatorrhea, you're really thinking about small bowel um, malabsorption issues or pancreatic disorders. So you may need to do some additional endoscopy with biopsies or abdominal imaging or even an ERCP. We're all GIs, so we love to scope. And uh, the role for colonoscopy is clearly indicated for these um, indications. And if you, the mucosa is normal, you're going to want to biopsy if you're looking for microscopic colitis, amyloidosis, or any of these uh, more rare conditions. But the question is, is, should everybody get a colonoscopy who comes in the door with chronic diarrhea? And I think there was an abstract in last year's DDW that highlighted why that may not be a good idea. This was a retrospective study of about 540 patients who were referred for open access colonoscopy for the diagnosis of chronic diarrhea. And in this group, the colonoscopy with the biopsies only led to a change in management in 18% of patients. So that's obviously not a lot, and it really um, suggests that prior to just a reflex colonoscopy for primary care doctors or GI doctors, you really need to do a more uh, thorough evaluation first. Earlier this year, there were new guidelines released on the medical management of microscopic colitis, so I went to review them briefly. Evaluation has not changed. You're going to want to stop, of course, any medications that may be contributing or exacerbating, PPIs, NSAIDs, and SSRIs being the most common. The first-line therapy at this point is clearly budesonide, and that's based off of uh, a meta-analysis looking at six randomized controlled trials showing a clear benefit of budesonide for achieving clinical and histologic remission. So that leaves mesalamine as a second-line therapy. There was a good randomized controlled trial that showed that patients on budesonide were twice as likely to achieve clinical and histologic remission than patients on mesalamine. With bismuth subsalicate, the data is very poor, and of course there is a lot of pill burden asking your patients to take nine pills a day, and there's some concern for long-term toxicity. There was a very small study, a randomized control trial, for looking at the role for prednisone um, in refractory budesonide as a possible option. Now, most people, when they give a course of budesonide, give an eight-week course. And that's because about a third of your patients are not going to require therapy beyond that. But that does leave a lot of patients who are going to need maintenance therapy with budesonide based off of several randomized controlled trials looking at doses between 3 and 6 milligrams for time periods between 6 and 12 months, showing an improvement in maintaining clinical remission. The data on cholestyramine is poor. There's one study that showed there's no incremental benefit from adding cholestyramine to mesalamine, but we do need more studies looking at cholestyramine as monotherapy. Everyone loves probiotics, but at this point, there's no great data for using probiotics in these patients. Now, unlike microscopic colitis, where the treatment is pretty clear, the treatment for IBS is not. But we're in an exciting time in that there's a lot of new medications that Dr. Chang, Dr. Chang is going to be discussing um, in a little bit. So I'm going to be focusing on the non-FDA-approved medications that most of us have been using uh, in our practice. Two years ago, both the AGA and the ACG published their recommendations for medical treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. And focusing first on antidepressants, there was a meta-analysis of 17 randomized controlled trials, 10 of which used tricyclic antidepressants, showing a clear benefit in relief of global IBS symptoms and abdominal pain independent of the antidepressant side effects, with the antidepressant effects, with a very impressive number needed to treat of four. 
But as we all know, tricyclics have a lot of side effects, and many of these studies were using high doses, 50 milligrams or higher of tricyclics, so the number needed to treat is high. The data for SSRIs is uh, much more inconsistent, and so for that reason, the AGA gave a recommendation against SSRIs, but for tricyclics. The ACG, however, combined all of antidepressants into one category and gave a weak recommendation for that. Antispasmodics um, are very um, appealing because they have been shown to improve abdominal pain and global IBS symptoms. And with our diarrhea patients, they're appealing because most antispasmodics have an anticholinergic property, which in some patients may decrease stool frequency. With some of the new medications out there, it's probably good to remind everyone that we have a peripheral mu opioid receptor agonist out there, loperamide, that we've been using. The AGA gives this a conditional recommendation. Even though the data is poor, this is a cheap medicine, it works well for diarrhea, and it's readily available without a prescription. The ACG did not recommend it, but that's likely because they did not. They combined both the constipation and diarrhea patients. Now, there's a relatively new theory in the pathophysiology of IBS, with some reports showing that up to 25 or 50 percent of your patients with IBS have bile acid malabsorption. And for those of you who may not have this physiology memorized, a quick review, fun functional enterohepatic circulation reabsorbs about 95% of bile acids in the terminal ileum. This causes release of an ileal hormone, FGF19, into the portal circulation, which then binds hepatocytes and causes an inhibition of bile acid synthesis, a classic feedback loop. The hypothesis the hypothesis in these patients is that there's a deficiency in the FGF19 levels, so there is an increase of bile acids being released into the, um, the colon. The landmark study that showed this was back in 2009, where this study showed that patients with bile acid diarrhea had lower FGF19 levels, and this has been replicated in other studies. They also showed an inverse relationship, so that as the FGF19 level was lower, the rate of hepatic bile acid synthesis was greater. Last year, a group in Sweden published a study that showed a correlation between bile acid malabsorption and acceleration in colonic motility. And in a very small subset of the IBS patients who had clear bile acid malabsorption, there was an eight-week open-label trial using a bile acid sequestrant that showed some pretty good results with statistically significant improvements in the IBS symptom severity score. So obviously more trials need to be done, but there is at least some suggestion of how bile acids may play a role in producing an IBS phenotype. We've talked a lot about biomarkers so far in this conference, and it would be ideal to know which patients that I should be using bile acid sequestrants on. And there's a lot of potential biomarkers that have been emerging. The Mayo Clinic's been looking at some. And I think maybe one of the more promising will be the serum FGF19. The F serum FGF19. But for most of us, we diagnose bile acid diarrhea by assessing how the patients respond to bile acid sequestrants. And I would just say that in many patients who have uh, inability to tolerate cholestyramine, you may want to try a PO form um, as an alternative. There are some new potential treatments that are being evaluated right now, such as farsenoid X receptor agonist that would help increase the FGF19 level. So raise your hand if you feel confident using the Rome criteria to diagnose IBS. All right, and the reason is that everyone raised their hand is that the sensitivity and the specificity is not 90 to 95 percent. So many of our patients with IBS end up having a lot of additional testing, which is not only um, expensive, but also puts a strain on your patients emotionally. So it would be ideal if we had biomarkers that could more accurately diagnose our patients with IBS.
Also, we've talked about how IBS is very heterogeneous and what works for one person may not work for another. So if we could have IBS biomarkers that could help direct individualization of IBS therapy, that would be incredibly helpful. There was a meta-analysis last year that looked at the role of inflammatory biomarkers to rule out inflammatory bowel disease in patients who have IBS symptoms. And this study showed that if the patient has a CRP of less than 0.5 or a fecal calprotectin less than 40, there is a less than 1% risk, a less than 1% probability of your patient having IBD. That's quite impressive, and some people would argue pretty much effectively rules out IBD. Of note, ESR is of no value, so you may not want to get this test as part of your workup. Also last year, there is a release of a new test that can diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. And this new test was based off of this study, which looks at post-infectious IBS models and the role of antibodies in producing IBS phenotypes. This study looked at two of these antibodies, the anti-CDTB CDTB and anti-vinculin, and the study assessed the effectiveness of using these two antibodies in diagnosing IBS and differentiating IBS from inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, and healthy controls. So as you can see here with the optical densities, the antibody levels for both of these were greater in IBS patients than in all of the other subgroups. So for this biomarker, we're trying to diagnose IBS. So we want to focus on the specificity and the positive likelihood ratio. So for that, keeping that in mind, if you look at these titers, the specificity is pretty impressive, um, 83 to 92%, which some would argue is even greater than the Rome criteria. So already we have some potential biomarkers that we can use to help rule out IBD in some of our patients that we believe have IBS and potentially rule in IBD, or IBS, sorry, diagnose IBS. In the near future, there's a lot more biomarkers that, have, that are going to be released and that are being studied anywhere from gut dysbiosis models to functional brain MRI imaging. And the idea is that biomarkers revolutionize the treatment for cancer. And so hopefully in the near future, we may be ready for our own biomarker revolution. So some last take-home points. Always make sure to take a good medication and supplement history. Colonoscopy with random biopsies may not be high yield as the first approach to treating these patients. A subgroup of your patients with microscopic colitis are going to need maintenance therapy with budesonide. Antidepressants are very effective for treating IBS, but they do have a lot of potential side effects. For some of your IBSD patients, you may want to consider a trial of a bile acid sequestrant. And keep a lookout in the next couple of years for the usage of biomarkers to help rule out IBD in your patients and perhaps even diagnose IBS. Thank you very much.